Today, live from the London Podcast Studio, I have two real media podcast experts here uh, to help me cover the latest industry news. First up is the producer and organiser of Radio TechCon, Anne Charles. Anne, how have you been? Oh, very good. Thank you. I think I'm still recovering from being at Radio Days in Prague, but it was it was really fun. It was fun, it was wasn't it? What, what did you think was the, was the big topic? Um, well, you couldn't really escape AI yes. and the classic, oh, in true radio conference format... Uh, there's no point in continuing because the new <laughs> things come along. I think I was saying to you in the bar one night, like if radio people started organising crockery conferences, we'd just be like, plates are done, <laughs> fuel is coming, that's it, we might as well give up now. So there was a bit of that classic radio conference vibe of being yes. like, there's a cool thing, but that means we're out of a job, let's just stop. Yeah, but part of me thought, I'd quite like to automate quite a lot of my job and then I could just sit at home on the sofa. Is that the way it works? I think I'd be fired, probably. Uh, also with me is the MD of Gold Waller Productions, Faraz Osman. Hello, welcome back. Hi, how you doing? Uh, I'm good. Uh, what have you been up to? I'm fasting at the moment. It's like five past. We're recording oh. this at five past six in the evening. I haven't eaten or drunk anything <laughs> in hours. This, this is going to be the most chaotic podcast of all time because Lord only knows what's going to come out of my mouth because I don't really know my own name at the moment. Or you I'm just might, might just slump uh, halfway through. Right? I might have a little kip. Don't do that. This is going to be the most exciting podcast ever. Don't have a kip. I may say something incredibly controversial. Before. Well, uh, so, uh, another place that hopefully you wouldn't fall asleep is the cinema. And this is our, our first story. Uh, lots of people over the Easter break flocked to the cinema, uh, probably for the first time since COVID. Movies are booming. We've got uh, movies like uh, John Wick, Chapter 4 out, and Super Mario Brothers filling out seats. According to Comscore, the domestic box office stands at $2.3 billion. That's up 36% from the same period last year. And and a near 600% improvement on a COVID-infected 2021. Uh, for us, you've just been to the cinema today. What to, is, to see Super Mario Brothers. Was it, was it good? It is. It's, it's good. I mean, it's nostalgia, like, heavy. So I was, like, in my element. I'm like, oh, my God, there's so many video games that I know. There's Yoshi in the background. This is the greatest thing ever. But I think that... I actually made a prediction on this show mm. a number of number of years ago, I think it was, saying that the video games are going to take over from comic books as the next big thing. And here it is. Well, video games already generate more revenue, don't they, than, than movies do. Yeah, but you were now seeing that crossover. Mm. So obviously Last of Us has been massive on mm. HBO. I think this Mario movie is is going to be like the next kind of multiverse that we've seen. I mean, Illumination have done it. They're the guys behind Despicable Me, most famously. And I think that this is going to be their thing. It's a great deal they've done with Nintendo. And I think we're going to see a lot of these almost like every year in the same way that we have with the Avengers, and which it has, and has, has had a big downturn since Disney Plus has kind of come onto the market. Um, nobody seems to be going to the cinema to watch those films anymore. And the animation films, you know, in Canto and and was mainly seen streaming because of the pandemic. Frozen was a massive hit. Avengers Endgame was a massive hit. Those were the things that brought people into the cinemas. As, mm. we, as much as we wish it was the BAFTA and award and Oscar award winning, you know, shows, it's actually it's these big family movies. And there's been I don't think there's been one of this scale for quite a while. So you you were there with some actual real life little people with actual children. Um, did they get it? So they, they, oh, they were losing their minds because like you know the Nintendo Switch has been so popular mm. that, that Mario has, has kind of had a resurgence these video games have had such a resurgence and Nintendo have been at the forefront of it being for that younger generation because PlayStation and Xbox who have kind of been the the, the brand that have ruled mm. in the video game space for such a long time they are for an older audience and it's always Nintendo that when they bring their IP out that's what brings the kids out and Illumination and Nintendo have just done a really smart thing of bringing it all together it's a, it's a really good and good looking it's definitely not what is it the early 90s film with Bob Hoskins it's, yeah. defi- it's definitely not that um, there's some brilliant performances in it it looks amazing and it looks it looks like the video game because the video games now look amazing so it just all kind of makes sense from an animation point of view and I, I what I'm curious about is are these stats like the reality of everyone going back to the cinema or is this because of this one movie right I know this article mm. mentions John Wick 4 but actually the reality is is that this is mainly being driven by this one film in the same way that like Frozen 2 mm. mainly and Avengers Endgame mainly drove a lot of audiences back into the cinema but they're going to need to find these hits every cycle to actually make sure that people continue to buy the very expensive cinema tickets um and, and keep that industry going. And are we seeing a return to the cinema or is it just some some one-off tentpole movies? 
Well, it was seeming like there was some there's some strategy around actually releasing things straight to cinema again, mm. which I guess gives it a bit of that exclusivity and a reason for people to go out. And I suppose as well, after the pandemic and stuff like that, we're starting to kind of come out of our cocoons at last, aren't we? And, and doing things again. So it's really good news for people who are running cinemas, because yes, I know they, it's been quite dodgy for them for quite some time. They've got some material. I saw Air at the weekend, which is the story of the Nike Air trainer, Air Jordans. That's a film that has been uh, bought by Amazon and was thought it would go straight to straight to streaming but clearly has had a sort of cinematic appearance and some people were saying that's because films that have been on in the cinema people then are more likely to go and watch on streaming because it's a proper film yes it's a real thing and therefore it's kind of feeling like they've got an advantage to having that streaming subscription yeah but, but that kind of like media leveling up thing has is actually kind of where we are right now because we have YouTube and social channels and they all want TV shows and then they get TV shows and all the TV shows want to be in the cinema. There's, there's this kind of curious thing of of everyone wants to be in that, as you say, that more exclusive space as they go that kind of like legitimises the content even further. So I think that there's a bit of a marketing tactic going on for sure. You're seeing a lot of films from Netflix and Apple kind of doing these cinematic releases. A, so they can be part of the awards season and kind of get, get that, that nod. But also... Because it just, as, as you said, it just kind of makes them feel like they're, they're, they're prettier and nicer and more seductive as, as pieces of content in a really noisy world. I mean, we also had cinemas being very grumpy when HBO Max uh, sent a lot of their films straight to streaming. Is the cinema industry and the streaming industry actually now more linked? Do they need each other to be successful uh, for them both to, both to thrive in this space? What do you think? I guess it is a symbiotic relationship, isn't mm. it? Uh, having the release to uh, the cinema as well also, I guess, means that you've got two bites of the cherry in terms of marketing as well, because mm. you've got the option to kind of go, hey, it's exclusively available in cinemas, and then, oh, miraculously, it's only available if you subscribe to insert, as we call it in our household, posh telly of your choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's true, isn't it, for us? Like, it's the mar- marketing issue for streamers is quite a troubling part of, of, of what they're doing. They're, they're making so much material... And if they're sort of dump releasing whole TV seasons, um, they don't have a lot of chance to build buzz. It's, this is a way of, of building buzz for, for movies too. Yeah, I mean, look, we've, we always talk about this. When you see a, a movie poster, when you see it, when you go past every Odeon and View Cinema in, in every town in some country and you see the title of, of a film, you know, you may miss it. But then you can go home and watch it on streaming. It just it just feels like you're getting more value out of your ever increasing streaming subscription um, and and those things like exactly as Anne says it's it's about marketing and and this feels like it's just another way of putting literally putting the small you know putting things on a big screen that you can then go and watch in the small screen in the corner of your living room and and that feels like it's providing the consumer value but also providing a more premium experience if you decide to upgrade and, and get your cinema ticket it, it kind of makes sense and people are spending money on streaming at home and March saw a four percent increase in spending uh, on streaming it's the highest rise in in five months. This is according to Barclays, looking at um, looking at our bills. Um, do you think there's any particular reason for the uptick? Is this like Succession, Last of Us, or I think it's a cost of living thing. Mm. So I think um, I remember um, Catelyn Moran talking about this um, about telly consumption. That actually, if you've got a relatively low cost, reliable source of entertainment, especially during the winter when it's been completely mm. miserable, then you might well go right. We're going to we're going to stick with one streaming thing you know if you've got children it's probably disney or it might be netflix or whatever and then that's your your entertainment because you're probably not going out as much for expensive cinema trips or expensive theater or bowling and all of that kind of stuff so my my guess is that it's we're staying at home a bit more and trying to save some money and and that's what it is for us good good value so people are, are piling into it yeah, I mean, I've been. Everyone's saying lipstick effect to me, which is the thing that I only heard about last year. Yo, which tell, is, tell us so this is this is this kind of economic, we're going to kind of wander into those economic kind of podcasts that we do and kind of feel very highbrow. But this is one of those phenomenons where people spend a bit more money on little luxuries. They call it a lipstick effect because it means that people want to go to like a department store mm. and buy something. This is incredibly misogynistic of me. I mean, I don't know. Well, I, 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 buy I, I can wear yeah. lipstick I, too. I, I'm not wearing lipstick, yeah. but you know, I might try it one day. Um, but people go and they buy kind of a small luxury mm. items sunglasses or you know because it makes them feel special it makes them feel like they're buying something but they're not spending thousands of pounds or something so again in this kind of going to the theater or going to a restaurant you're more likely to spend more money in more expensive supermarkets 
to eat at home because you're saving money but you still feel you're like you're getting that luxury and that's what's going on with streaming services as well is that people are going well i'm going to make more use of my premium streaming services but not go out as much and, and sit on the sofa and it's apparently it's this thing called a lipstick effect and it, it's kind of very much in vogue right no, that, now that, that makes a lot of sense um and just on streaming have, have both of you watched uh, the latest uh, episode of succession are you a succession watcher at all, Anne? I don't have posh Ellie. Ah, uh, Faraz? Yes, I watched it. I watched it last. I watched. Did half you watch of it, it last at night. like three AM when no, it drops? Uh, no, I didn't do there. that. Okay. I watched half of it and then my son woke up at literally the worst possible time. <laughs> so I've kind of not properly seen the last twenty minutes of it. Um, but I must say, I was. I don't know. Was I surprised about this? The Daily Mail. I'm not going to say what it is, but the Daily Mail front page today, which mm. is basically the biggest spoiler in TV mm. probably of the last five years since like the Game of Thrones funeral. Like, it, they just had it on the front page. And it's a bit like... Well, what is the amount of time you've got to maintain spoilers for? Right, and, and so I only I watched it last night because I, I did a binge on The Last of Us and now I've done a catch-up on The Succession. <laughs> you could tell that Lipstick Effect is in full effect in my household right now. We are very much enjoying premium television for that one hour of peace and quiet we get when our kids have gone to sleep. But seeing that spoiler on the front page mm. was a big thing. Everyone was obviously talking about it. I knew something was going on because every time I logged into a social media platform that's not just Twitter. Let's not get into that conversation. But you know that something was happening on this show that was a very big episode. And then it just kind of appeared on the front page of the Daily Mail. And I, like, look, my view is is that Daily Mail know what they're doing. Yes. The Daily Mail love triggering people. And I think that that's why they've done it. I just think it's it's just poor form. I just like, why are you doing that? And, and, all... and what's the statute of limitations on spoilers? Oh, and any, anymore? Are you allowed a day, a week? There's an etiquette, isn't there? Oh, God. I, well, I suppose it is always polite to say spoiler alert, but how different would it have been if there'd been a massive storyline in EastEnders or Coronation mm. Street back in the day? Then would they have had a front page be, being it, like it, shock it, horror insert character name has died it would be night <laughs> after whatever. broadcast wouldn't it in in old telly yeah i mean I, exactly that's the thing that i think a lot of people mm. don't watch these things live as mm, you say yeah. it mm. dropped at three in the morning like mm. on on sky atlantic it's like you know that's not how people are consuming things on broadcast and look it's a big pop culture moment that's happened and they obviously want to be part of that conversation well, for the me- for the media elite for the media for the media yeah. el- elite yeah. i have no idea i mean I've, <laughs> I've heard a succession but i feel very left out of this it's, conversation it's de- de- definitely worth, i should worth, definitely worth, save worth up and watch, watch it we'll, we'll get, yeah. you, we'll get you the dvd uh, <laughs> okay moving on to a different kind of television this is broadcasters getting busy with the bbc unveiling its special programming to mark the coronation of his majesty the king and her majesty the queen consort and anything that surprised you of the bbc's rundown of what they're doing across telly and, and radio and online it seems a bit slapdash Ooh. and quite light um i'm sure they'll do a brilliant job of the you know everyone walking to church uh, as i've recorded it before uh, they'll do a lot of that there'll be lots of oh, as we all know of course the uh, the soldiers with the green stripes <laughs> on are from the insert you know there'll be lots of wonderful yes. facts they should they should do that bit brilliantly um because that is what they're for right if, if the bbc mm. can't get that bit right then goodness knows um the rest of it i think possibly because it all, all comes on a press release uh, and so you, it does look a little bit scattergun it probably all makes sense in context go on give us the highlights well what what is really good is that they are going to be having a sign language um, version of the commentary on BBC Two and mm. there's also going to be an audio described version on Red Button and on iPlayer so people who are visually impaired um, there will be more description about what's going on which is absolutely brilliant. There are several variations on the theme of I once meant Prince slash King Charles and I have an anecdote, which might be interesting in real life, but the way they're selling it sounds quite dull. Um, like, why can't we interview him? Uh, and also the thing that, obviously on Coronation Day, you wouldn't want to do this, but there's absolutely nothing in the schedule that is covering... Um, some people don't like the monarchy and maybe we ah, should talk yes. about that. And there's not much in terms of historical context because what I noticed um, around the time of the Queen's death was how many people... I mean, I'm a bit of a constitutional nerd, so I find all this stuff fascinating, but how many people in my you know in my acquaintance who just really didn't have any firm grasp of the difference between the king as an individual person and the monarchy and how that's different now compared mm. with 100 years ago there, there doesn't seem to be much of kind of putting it into context although that might come out in the commentary so i yeah i was also amused by the fact that obviously the pictures are always better on the radio but one of the highlights <laughs> 
highlights from BBC Sounds was a programme about the gardens at Highgrove. And I'm like, that might possibly <laughs> be one time when maybe the pictures might be helpful as well. well but, I, yeah. I was reading Bill Rogers's blog, um, who reports on lots of BBC things. And he said, if you, if you look at the press release, you can tell the people who didn't quite get their homework in on time. So like Radio <laughs> 3, it was like, Radio 3 will have a lovely selection of music. And yes. it's like, yes, they haven't, they haven't told them what's going on already. Radio. Maybe they don't know yet. <laughs> There's a coronation here. You see, I would have done something looking at the, the King Charles's through history and kind oh. of c- comparing and contrasting the role of monarchy in different times. But, you know, they three go... Part, three part I play a special. Exactly, something like see, that. I, but, I pitched an idea about how all the crown jewels were stolen from India and I got laughed out of the building. <laughs> but, like, so. they're a bit like, we can't, we can't, can't possibly can't, can't talk about that. And I'm a bit like, you kind of can because they're on display and you probably should talk about the fact that... But anyway, that's a whole well, other conversation um, for another time. Uh, on, on that, on um, that. With, the, with the crown, the crown has had to be widened for the king so there are extra new oh, sorry you're not talking about the Netflix show you're no, now talking is, about right is, okay so the actual physical crown yeah. has had to be what it's just a bigger hat uh, I yes, mean like they've look, had to put in more, more jewels so uh, your, your, doc, your, your doc could have sure. had an extra episode I mean cool like the thing, the thing this is like what's uh, the real story behind this is the BBC and the fact that we're only talking about the BBC and this is what the BBC are doing and this is another time when like the BBC comes under both huge amounts of scrutiny and celebration at the same time at the same time that the the crown as in the royal family are going to have the same thing and i think that it's going to be really interesting to see how this lands because you know i would argue that probably the majority of the country like this and they like the kind of pomp and the circumstance well they they like the big fans they're big fans of the queen exactly are they such big fans of new king and and i and i'm kind of just fascinated just as a kind of media wonk on how you walk this line because mm. I, I don't I don't know what the right answer is you know there there is I've heard rumours that it's like they're going to go big like really big and is that going to land really well or do we need that as a country to kind of basically thrust our chest out and say you know we are Britain and this is how we this is how we roll I don't know if things maybe Prince Charles should say that <laughs> that could be the opening part of his speech but I, like there's there's a lot of really interesting nuance around this kind of from a pop culture point of view about how this is going to land and like I said this is a very BBC moment although I do love the press release picture you should all look at it because it looks like it's been drawn by like Dali and chat GPT <laughs> the most airbrushed picture of all time and and I just think that all of those like moments the attention to detail that BBC do around this stuff is par excellence no one else can get anywhere close to it so it's going to be interesting to see if it's going to if it's going to land as a show or as an event well i was talking to someone over the weekend who is actually working on the coronation for the royal family uh, and organizing the actual event and they were saying that um, obviously there aren't lots of people around from the last coronation uh, but they kept immaculate records of the last ones they've been kind of reviewing all of that and seeing how it was done last time before it obviously gets uh, a, a sort of more modern uh, spin this time but I did say to the person, are you concerned that all of your emails will be kept and then in, in the next one or, or one in the future, people will be looking through, seeing how you uh, put together the guest list? Did you watch last night's succession? Yes. Oh, OK, because that's, that's a plot line from last night's succession about the records being kept. <laughs> oh, well, it's also like the health and safety stuff being quite different, isn't it? I think for um, the Queen's coronation, they had like 8,000 people in the Abbey and they closed it for three months to build the stands or something. And so it was, it was a year. They closed oh it for gosh, a year. Oh, my gosh, really? And, um, yeah, 8,000 people on rickety yeah. things. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. Can't do that anymore. Um, someone else that's been investing in things, though, is uh, the large media organisation Global. These are the people that own Capital FM, Harton and LBC. And they're making some more investments in Glasgow and rejigging what they do with their Scottish versions of Heart and Capital. And what have they been up to? Um, so there's going to be more programming actually coming from Scotland for a Scottish audience, which is good. Heart and Capital are both having more programmes that are coming from Scotland um, every day. I think they're having a breakfast show as well. Um, that's special. So um, I think, yeah, so what, what they're doing is they think they're going all daytime is going to come from Scotland now. So from, from six to seven, which is quite an update on just, I think, drive time shows being yes. bit, being local. Um it's quite a surprise because generally the view has been that radio is getting less local. Why do you think they're piling into to Scotland? 
I mean, I'm presuming there's some sort of like tax rebate or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I'm guessing it's better for the advertiser. There's going to be some financial reason why it's a good idea, isn't it? It's not going to be for the love of broadcasting as a whole. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I, there are some people saying, oh, I wonder if this is getting ready in case it's independence. But I, I think there'd be a bit more notice if Scotland yes. was going to become independent. And I think um, if, if anything, we're f- maybe further away from that than, than we were before. And obviously, Bauer and the BBC have both got big bases in mm. Glasgow. So, um, I mean, any more jobs going in a broadcasting industry and jobs outside London is a good thing. And I think they're also um, have they're going to be upgrading their studios and doing more visualisation and stuff like that. So, I guess it makes it a hub for for selling yeah, advertising think, as well. I think Global also have quite a big um, IT uh, developer group up there as well. So, I think Glasgow does actually become a pretty big production centre. I mean, for us, it's something that we we see more and more is large broadcasters actually investing outside of London. Obviously, a lot was driven by the BBC, but we've seen Channel 4 do that, ITV as well. Are people doing it for the right reasons now rather than they're sort of being forced to by the government? We talk a lot about the, this view from London. Mm. You know, we're sitting in a London podcast studio chatting about this this stuff. And, and actually, the Brexit aftershocks means that people have kind of woken up to the reality that there are people that live in the country outside mm. of the M25. That kind of makes a lot of sense. So Channel 4, BBC doing it, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's going to be really interesting to see if, if commercially it, it makes sense. I think kind of to your point earlier, there must be a financial reason for doing this. Global are a commercial organisation. So if, if we look at their ratings, so um, I was looking at their ratings from 2004, uh, which was how far back my, my computer went uh, looking at this. And since then... Clyde One and Fourth One, which are Bowers radio stations, have actually grown audience, which is sort of amazing, really. Uh, meanwhile, the global stations, which have been less local over the past 10 years, have halved their audiences. So is it actually just an attempt for them to, to, to realise, you know, if we, if we want to grow it, we've got to make some, some big changes? Well, if I was to do a kind of post-deconstruction of how where we are today and what's going on, obviously there was a lot of consolidation. Mm. There was a lot of kind of shows that were syndicated across the country and et cetera. But now we're in this streaming world of Spotify and Apple Music and people listening to whatever they want to do, or whatever they want. It kind of feels like if you're going to have to have a radio station, you're going to want that to feel as local as possible. And so if you're going to listen to radio, you don't want it to feel generic because then you can just go into your streaming Mm -hmm. service and listen to it over there. So from that perspective, it it kind of makes sense. But it'll be interesting to see if commercially it bears out. But I've just read that my old friend Cap Cubie's got a show, which is great. So yes. I'm going to text her now and say congratulations. <laughs> well, one thing Anne mentioned was more visualisation. Uh, and we're seeing that not only in radio, but in podcasts. So YouTube has now added a podcast tab. We're in a, vi- a lovely visualised studio at the London Studios, the London Podcast Studios here at the moment. Is podcasting now going to have made that leap from just being audio to actually now being a video thing? I hope so, because I'll get more work. But, like, <laughs> but I, you know, this whole thing about podcasting and what it is, we're now just talking about chat shows, right? Yes. And and that's kind of what it is. If you look at all those late night chat shows you see in America, a lot of those look very similar to what podcasts look like now. It's just that people are putting sometimes fake microphones in front. Mm. I was watching John Stewart's interview the other day with, with Ian Hislop and like they have microphones in front of them that aren't plugged in. And it's <laughs> but but like it kind of makes sense. I know you used to watch John Stewart on a Daily Show. Mm. It just feels like another episode of the Daily Show. It's really entertaining. I watch the whole thing on YouTube because why would I want to just listen to that? So this this kind of you know it isn't a surprise. So kind of why not turn the cameras on? It's, it's you're able to do it. And it makes sense. I mean, and there's a really interesting thing in podcasting that if you're a sort of podcast originalist, uh, it's all about audio and RSS feeds and consuming it in, in those devices. Whereas if you talk to someone under 25, they think of podcast as a form, not really as a medium. And that's basically people in a room like this chatting to each other. Um, and they would call that a podcast, whether it was a YouTube video or it you know, didn't even need to be on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. I mean, that's one of the things that, has the audio industry has got to grapple with is is that the audience are after video as well. Well, I think the audio industry got the hang of this a very long time ago. So I'm I'm kind of surprised that everyone's going, oh my gosh, you're visualising. Wow, that's amazing. Um, because you need to visualise, you need to have some sort of visual content in order to share on social media. The trick with the podcast is that it is audio first. So you still, in, my, be. Well, in my mind, you still need to be able to shut your eyes and it work mm. for it to be a podcast rather than a vodcast or a live stream video or something like that. And so you still, if you're doing a multi-platform kind of thing, you still need to know which one is the the one that's the most important to you because otherwise the whole thing kind of falls apart and you but, do every single thing but badly. It, but is the th- is it 
is it important to different is different things important to different audiences is a 23 year old who wants to watch it on youtube um going to be different to a 45 year old who's getting it in their headphones well yes obviously I mean, that's the same. Well, with, <laughs> that's pick? the same with any audience. Well, with any content creation, it's knowing what you want to make and who you're aiming it for, isn't mm. it? I mean, that's that's the same anywhere. I would say that most people who are making podcasts need some way of visualising in order to make because of sharing on social. Mm. Obviously, there are some people who are watching it entirely on YouTube. I think you're daft if you don't have some presence on YouTube if you've got a regular podcast. But there's a whole world of of audio based podcasts mm. as well. That if you're thinking about podcasting as in like uh, some sort of investigative documentary or something like that then you're probably not going to be visualizing it in the same way as if you're doing a chat cast but is that a phrase going to be a problem uh, if you, you're not going to be promoted by youtube or if spotify are really leaning into video and a lot of their podcasts now you can click on the window and watch it whilst uh, rather than just listening to it that if you're audio only you're a second class podcast citizen yeah, yeah it's all about the money right and and actually all of these things are funded from a commercial perspective, and if you are able to have lots of different, you know, audio adverts and video adverts and click-throughs, etc., you need to have your, you know, you need to have that engagement. I think what's curious is is that social media platforms, you know, for a while were kind of based on. This is getting a, a bit esoteric, but it's, it was based on one sense, right? So with Twitter, you looked at it, but you didn't listen to it, right? With podcasts, you listened to them, but you didn't look at them. And and then the ones that have been most successful, Instagram, TikTok, are, are apps that you have to go into and you have to watch them and listen to them at the same time. And that is a dynamite when it comes to advertising revenue, mm. right? So I think podcasts have kind of gone, well, if we want to continue to make more money out of this and grow that space... We're going to need to get all of the attention because you can't have a situation where you're listening to one thing and you're not listening to the adverts properly and you're looking at your Instagram and Instagram is, is serving you lots of still videos, still pictures of, of adverts and you're clicking through to that and making your purchase from there. Well, that means that you're even though you've engaged them from an audience perspective, you haven't engaged them from a commercial perspective. So kind of getting all of that attention in the app is what I think Spotify in particular and, and YouTube are looking to do. And in any way that they can make sure that they have every single one of your senses, you know, taste and smell is coming for you next. But like certainly having your ears and having your eyes and your thumbs, if you have all of that at the same time, then you're far more likely to make a, a commercial decision. In this week's deep dive, we're going to be deep in on the media bill. Joining us is media lawyer Samuel Ostianis to explain the nuances of the draft legislation and what he thinks will be the changes that matter most for the industry. We were somewhat disappointed that we didn't see a media bill sooner. It was 11 mm. months in the work. But when you see what's actually been produced, it's a very difficult document. And the people who have spent the hours and hours in, in drafting that have done have done a fairly good good job, mm. to be honest. It's a very large document with track changes-esque. <laughs> and it does take a lot of brain power to kind of go through it, to really understand what it means. You need the Communications Act open. You need other legislation open. You need the media bill. You need the explanatory notes as well and the memorandum that goes with it to truly understand what, what the intention is here in a lot of respects. Or, of course, a great law firm to help you. That obviously Absolutely. That yeah. work. Um, and on the audio front, it's interesting as it introduces some uh, some potential regulations for smart speaker operators or people who act as gatekeepers mm -hmm. uh, in the audio world. Mm -hmm. Was this something that people expect? I know from my radio background, it's something that, that the radio industry has been talking about maybe internally for quite mm -hmm. a while. How have the, the streamers found uh, the interest in, in their work? So it's probably, I would say, the biggest surprise in the media bill. Firstly, it wasn't referenced in the media mm. white paper that mm. came in April. So it, do, it did come as, as somewhat as a surprise. It asks them essentially to carry radio services that are also broadcast over the internet onto their platforms for free. So they can't charge mm. the radio services to carry their platforms. So this is for BBC commercial, I guess, community licensed broadcasters. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you're a licensed service, and you're also available over the internet, then your service has to be carried on these designated services. Mm. The exact ones of what they will be, we don't specifically know. Again, the government's given some indication mm. in the press release. Spoiler alert, it does say Amazon by name. And so essentially they will be compelled to carry all of these services and not be in a position to charge 
for such carriage. Mm. The government say that the intention behind this is they want to make sure that the radio industry thrives, that it survives, that as we migrate away from FM, AM, even DAB, that people in all communities are still able to access those radio services that they know and love. And I suppose it's something that if, if, you're, a, if you're the government, um, you, know, you want licensed broadcasters to do things for the public good. That's kind of, they talk obviously mm-hmm. about news content or, or local content to a certain degree. Is this a bit of the government needing to offer you know, licensed radio services, something in the digital world to kind of keep them honest and doing some of the public goods they like them to do? It's a good question. I mean, I don't really know. It's the short Mm -hmm. answer what the government's intent behind it was. It's a a great point. It certainly does incentivise the right behaviours to ensure that you continue to invest in local news, to invest in local radio. And unless you have true universal coverage, the business case is difficult in the ability to sustain those practices, which are often quite expensive to have in the case of local news, local reporters on the ground. It's an expensive business. So unless you have true coverage, it's difficult. Uh, and if people want to keep track of what's happening uh, with the media bill, you guys have created a media tracker. That's right. Uh, what, what's it doing? If you Google CMS Media Tracker, um, we should come up pretty much at the top, I'd hope. I checked earlier. I think if you type in Media Tracker, we're pretty close to the top. And it's an interactive tracker, which wherever you're involved in in the media industry, whether you're radio, whether you're a PSB, whether you're an on-demand platform, it provides you with a condensed, very interactive, very immersive details on what is in the media bill. And it's constantly being updated. It got updated today even. And the great associates that we've got at CMS have spent many an hour going over 250 pages when you look at everything that mm. the government has, has, has produced, really condensed it in a readable form, also provided some insights into it based on, on our knowledge of the industry. And like I said, it's being updated all the time. So as this does go through Parliament, as it does evolve, if you want to know where the status is, if you want to know what the commentary and what people are saying, then it's a great place to, to go and look. That was Samuel Stianis from CMS Law. You can catch our conversation in full by signing up as a patron of the show. Uh, You know the drill. Just go to patreon.com slash mediapod where you'll find that and a whole load of other full length interviews. That's patreon.com slash mediapod. Plus, you can find a link to the CMS's media build tracker in our show notes. Still with me, uh, Anne and Faraz. It's always a perennial topic now. Uh, Musk and Twitter, part 17. This week, Twitter's been butting heads with the media after introducing a new label, which described many news organisations, including the BBC and NPR, as government-funded media. If you were to take that to its conclusion, uh, I think both SpaceX and Tesla would also have to have that same tag after all the money that that they've taken. Obviously, uh, the BBC refuted the label because they're not funded by the government. They're publicly funded by a licence fee. Though it's complicated. You know, it's complicated with the World Service and and other elements. Uh, NPR, very unhappy uh, with their their tag. And just before we came to record this, they announced that they're pulling all of their official channels off Twitter. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. So they're not going to be uh, on Twitter and their, their line is something like you know what's if, the point <laughs> if you're if, if you're trying to degrade our journalism then why would we why would we post here I think there's something interesting on that and in that um if I'm looking at it this is and if you read Musk's tweets uh, you know that he's basically anti-media and anything he can do to give the media a bit of a kick in he sees as, as jolly japes and this is what he's doing but uh, what did happen surprisingly is that one of the BBC's reporters uh, messaged him saying how about an interview and he said yes so he did an interview late last night Elon broadcast on Twitter spaces and the BBC put out uh, quite quickly this morning and have you watched it I have watched it yes what um, do you think well or during the interview Elon Musk did make a concession and say that they were going to change the label to publicly funded yes. media, but I don't know if they've they haven't done, done that yet. At this moment, at this but time, he said they would. Yes, um, mm. maybe it would mean that I get less people messaging me when I talk about it, saying, "Well, it is government funded." Your Lord Almighty Elon has said it's going to publicly. So that's. I was seeing people on Twitter there. who were determined to prove their point, and they kept linking to the BBC Media Action page, which was talking about where it received its funding, which is a you know a charity that's not part. And everyone was going, "That's not the same. The BBC Media Action is not the same as the." B-. And it was just, oh, he can't. Or is he don't play chess with a pigeon? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I have seen the interview. Uh, I I've seen some of it. And maybe it wasn't the best example of... Emily Maitlis, it was not. Yes. Yes. What Um, was wrong with it? 
Well, obviously, it's very, very easy for me to sit here and criticise mm. uh, because I don't think I could have done a better job. And it was very last minute. And Elon Musk is not an easy person to interview because he... It's an interesting character, isn't he? He'll start off saying something that seems quite sensible and then out of nowhere will just go off at, at a random tangent of whatever's in his brain at that moment in time. It did seem, however, that the interview was somewhat underprepared mm. and um, there were some lines that are, I could tell straight away were going to be used by people who want to bash the BBC and already are being bashed. Elon Musk turned it around quite a lot and was interviewing the interviewer on several occasions. And one of the points that Elon Musk said was about, uh, they were d discussing whether there'd been an increase in hatred Mm. as a result of the changes uh, that had been happening at Twitter. And the journalist said that he had noticed that there'd been some slightly more hateful material on his feed. And Elon Musk then said, oh, can you give me an example? And he couldn't. Yes. And that didn't go well. And there were some other things where um, BBC's coverage of coronavirus, the journalist asked about that. And then Elon Musk came back on him. And it, the, you just didn't have some facts to... Like, there are, there are statistics available on the BBC's coverage. There are statistics on hate speech which he did try and get in but he just didn't have that kind of brief of papers and bullet points of of known things that you're going to have to rebut and probably wasn't expecting Elon Musk to turn the interview around on him so it was a good scoop mm. um it was ter terribly badly shot I know they were doing it on um Twitter spaces but it was just a side a, like a two shot from the side I don't know why they didn't take any switching equipment because you quite there was no kind of shot close-ups or any mm. any switching um some people liked it because it was live um and so there was no opportunity to edit it you know and the people who think that everything's biased mm. um the version on iPlayer that I saw did sort of cut off at the end halfway through because I think it sort of didn't quite finish and it was going on to be a Twitter spaces conversation yeah. with Elon Musk so yeah I mean there were some good news lines out of it um it seems that he kind of bought Twitter because he thought he was going to be forced into it. Um, there was all sorts of weird stuff going on about Twitter. Uh, they've changed the sign on the Twitter building yeah. to like not have a W in it for some reason. And then Elon Musk was going, oh, we really wanted to turn half of our building into, oh, yeah, homeless shelter, but we're not allowed to. And it, that wasn't really followed up. It was just such a, it was bizarre. I mean, for us, this is sort of epic sort of Musk playing the media isn't it? it's like just say yes do something very quickly drag it off course don't play by the rules it's very trumpian isn't it yeah i'm so if this feels like the sort of story that should be catnip for me it's a technology mm. story that's also a media story that's also got you know and i just don't care anymore like i if, had it had this been even a year ago like i would have stopped everything and watched that interview and i just think it's this is going to be the same nonsense said in the same way it's going to change tomorrow and it's and this kind of like constant drumby of outrage and nonsense that kind of goes out there. tomorrow he'll say something else and it'll be completely different again there'll be another news story because that's the only way that they're able to kind of keep twitter in the headlines for everybody that i'm speaking to isn't using the platform anymore no. They've, they're just done with it because it's just not a decent experience you're not getting what you want anymore and and it just doesn't feel like you know the hallison days that it was when it first not even when it first started but even five years ago where you felt like you were getting a lot of information and the, the biggest issue with it is you can't curate your own, you know, there's a lot of chat about misinformation, etc. But having these space spaces, having these outlets that you can trust, mm. you know, you can have an argument about whether or not, you know, media bias, etc. But you decide as a user what you can trust and what you don't trust. And then having the platform constantly tell you you're trusting the wrong people and they're lying to you. It's a bit like, well, I'm done. I, I hear the, the criticisms of the interview. My understanding of it is that they were given you know, I think it's James Clayton who who did the interview, was given, what, all of 15 minutes to kind of go come to the building and sit down with you and do the interview. And I think that they just literally scrambled and, and did it. I and, and that, you know, yes, you should be more prepared at every instance where someone's going to call you up and, and have that interview with you. But that's kind of part of the playbook. It's like Donald Trump, you know, just kind of calling into a new studio mm -hmm. and just kind of rambling freewheeling. You don't know what he's going to say. You can't prepare for it. You don't know where it's going. And then you kind of get lots of news lines from it but you, you can't really put together a coherent sentence because he didn't say anything that was a coherent sentence. So I just I just feel like Twitter is now a case of what's Elon going to do next, as opposed to what are these interesting channels that I'm following, these interesting accounts that I'm following, what are they doing? I think the NPR story, is that is fascinating. Yeah, so um, M NPR have, have pulled themselves off the platform. And what's also interesting is for journalists, journalists, big, big, 
big tweeters we know, and they put their stories on there and they link to them. Um, Click through rates are really poor on Twitter. Right. Like any website that I've I've been involved with, and, and looking online uh, to some to some other media colleagues, they're saying actually it doesn't really generate the traffic. It, 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 it deserves. You might get hundreds of thousands of retweets, but really people aren't, aren't, aren't clicking through. So it, it, does it matter if NPR aren't there anymore? Effectively, for a lot of journalists and a, and a lot of platforms, it was being used as a newswire, mm. right? It was being kind of going, Let's, this is what's come out. We'll put it on Twitter because that's the quickest way to get it out there and disseminate the information. It's now not possible to do that. There is no doubt that there is a gap in the market. You know, we've talked a lot about Mastodon. We're talking a lot about other platforms that kind of seem to be emerging. Nobody has currently won that space yet. Again, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with podcasts and Spotify and actually just having feed-based media that's just text isn't monetizable in the way that we think it is. So commercially, can you make it work, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things added together means that there's a, there's a desire to have something that you can curate and you can, you know, you can work within in a social media space. But we're just all bored of the noise and the nonsense about these kind of niche characters who have huge followings, who've just taken the platform and run with it, and have kind of left the kind of general user shrugging their shoulders and going, well, this isn't for me anymore. I mean, and is, is there a sort of slight danger for, for Elon? He, he sort of wants to disrupt the media. People are sort of addicted to Twitter and the, and the network effects make it very difficult, as Faraz was saying, to create a, a competitor. Uh, but if journalists, news creators and content creators did leave the platform, it becomes a much less interesting thing for, for consumers and his advertisers. Yeah, it, it, the whole thing doesn't seem very thought through at all. I mean, his point is that Twitter was losing so much money that he had to make lots of redundancies and try and uh, and he's hoping to get it back into profit. He's also responsible for 90% of their revenue disappearing by being mad. Because so he, this week, this week he's off to speak to American advertisers to try and win them back onto the platform. Do you think this interview and what he's been tweeting will help him in that uh, in that regard? I don't know if it'll make much difference either way, really. I think he's got this ideological idea of uh, we can just have a free for all and that's really good. And the whole thing's been hampered by all these people having this sort of sense of moderation. And now, yeah, he doesn't quite get that the people who create the content that he'd like to go there for uh, are all disappearing. And so, it, I mean, maybe there's a market with whoever's left. But it's certainly, it's certainly not what it was, is it? Yes. It's such a shame. It's such a shame. It is. I, I, I like, genuinely, I, I miss it. I, mm. I miss kind of like being able to pull these things together and kind of going, well, this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in this and kind of seeing it. Like, look, you know, it, long, long other days, I, I miss the fact that my Uber taxi isn't as, as cheap as it used to be. <laughs> like, that's just how, the, how markets work. And, and I think that we, there may be a space for a new platform, but the, the world has moved on. And it'll be interesting to see if you know if twitter survives i mean we've said for a long time twitter's not going to survive but it, it does feel like it's creaking around the corners yeah. not from a technology point of point of view anymore but just because i just think the user base is just like i'm done with it i knew i should have sold my twitter username early yes on. you should have <laughs> but follow the media podcast on twitter and, and me and all of us <laughs> of right? course because of course. we still care about uh, validation i need to get my tiktok uh, <laughs> action sorted right um okay on to the the media quiz i have three questions about some other audio announcements I'll name two items from the headline. If you know the story that links them, buzz in with your name and then give me the answer. So for as you will say. For as. And Anne, you will say. Anne. Right, here we go. Crowdfunder and a ship named the Ross Revenge. What's the story? Anne. Anne. The uh, the Ross Revenge, which has been at some points in history the home of Radio Caroline, Mm. is not very well and needs some help. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. who'd have thought a creaky old ship that was ship. pretty bad in like the 60s uh, is still not in a, not in great shape yeah, well, in, I, in 2023 I think they used it for Radio Caroline from 1983 onwards but it's, right. it's been through the wars it's had it, like during the gales in the was it 87 the big storms I remember being woken up by my mother because it was a historical event anyway <laughs> the, the mast sort of fell down and it nearly Batters sank down the yeah, yeah it's the sort of thing my mum does she's like this is very historic <laughs> I remember her ironing her outside. I remember her ironing her way through Nelson Mandela being released <laughs> and making us watch the telly because it was historic and we were so surprised we were allowed to watch the telly it did work because I remember I'm going on your mum's place for the coronation <laughs> yeah. it sounds yeah. like there's yeah. been the most amount of fun M- there mum will have it mum will have it down <laughs> uh, right a uh, point to you uh, question number two book clubs and podcasts if, sorry for us this for is us. a thing to do with Apple Books and their partnership with Lemonade Media yes like they're, they're going to start yes. doing 
more podcasts about books on Apple Books, but also on the podcast app. <laughs> like, They're collaborating to offer a free-to-join digital program that unites storytelling across books and podcasts. Members will receive regular audiobook recommendations, then be able to tune into Lemonada podcasts to hear from the authors and participate in digital community events with other listeners. Sounds very Apple. Uh, So the problem was I saw this and I thought, oh, this sounds like a good idea, an audiobook club. And then I had a look at the website and it was really, it made no sense about what it was they were trying to do. Like, how do they build the community? Is there kind of a discussion around the book? And they already seem to have decided the title. So it's, it's a nice idea, but it, I, I was like, it doesn't, I don't get it. It's I mean, all, 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 audiobooks is sort of one of the, the, the secret successes in digital audio. Are you an Audible subscriber? Do you I'm, to I'm not. Well, I've, I've considered it once in a while, but I've never kind of, because I have my podcast feed is just out of control. that I don't need to add any more people talking into my ears. And um, I am an Audible subscriber. Yes. <laughs> yes. But this isn't an Audible project. No, but, it but, but, but is that them trying to compete with... Audible and, and, and have something that yes, and it's, brings more it's attention to it's a really good idea but I would say my feedback is the website it doesn't the press release doesn't seem to match up to what the website's saying it's doing but I'm I am i don't know if I'm having kind of like weird what are those weird memories you have that aren't real just fake false, false memories but like I thought that they had signed a deal with Oprah Winfrey to do a book club on Apple TV has that they probably have. not happened and has that gone away I don't know so it's number one like they're doing this elsewhere I think mm. and number two like just as a sidebar it has that whole thing about Apple podcast subscriptions just gone, or is that still happening? No, it's still it's still very much at the fore of what of what they're doing. This so is it, this is this Apple Apple this is Apple podcast subscriptions where people can subscribe to podcasts for ad free content uh, or for extra for extra content. But a lot more and more publishers are doing it partly because Apple help promote those shows, so you you, you kind of get more. Um, space on the storefront if you are and is, you so is that is this linked with that then so is this like you'll get a podcast that's that then links to apple books and it feels it feels like one of these things that like i just recently signed up for for apple one which i think mm. is really interesting because you get apple news plus and you get apple fitness and you get apple music and and it's like a, it's actually quite an interesting bundle but then you kind of have these services and you're a bit like is this part of it is this not part of it is this a mm. service that so are you like i get the whole service strategy for apple it's been incredibly successful for them as people buy less phones every year this feels like well let's kind of dip our toe into this space as well but it needs that level of coherence because really it's a one button it, push if people like us who are kind of quite motivated to go <laughs> oh how lovely an audiobook club oh yes please and then we're like uh, well, not, then yeah okay. sort out your landing page point, it's point, our feedback from that it's a point of peace uh, to, <laughs> for us and Anne uh, it's all to play for now question number three radio quizzes and TV Anne Anne what is this Popmaster is going to the telly yes if you haven't heard enough about Ken Bruce over the last uh, month uh, some more Ken Bruce news uh, he's taking Popmaster to uh, to Channel 4 or to more 4 uh, with a TV show made by 12 Yard Productions which is one of the ITV Studios owned indies uh, Faraz with your TV format head on do you think I, I'm not allowed to say much about this <gasps> oh. so I'm, I'm saying I'm saying very little about why it why aren't you allowed I'm not to say much, much about this. Oh, I'm not involved in any way okay. with a 12 Yard show I think it's an interesting mm. uh, it's a great commission for more for and I think it will kind of hopefully spur a lot of really interesting music spin-off programming so on the channel music quiz television is a good thing I think music programming on television <laughs> is generally a good thing and and I hope that more for continue to do lots more of it so uh, this begs the question as to why the entire time Popmaster was the most massive quiz ever on BBC radio at no point did anyone at the BBC go we should put this on the telly <laughs> Well, this is the problem because Ken Bruce had the rights to Popmaster, which is strange uh, in itself when he when he was on Radio 2. Apparently the BBC were offered it, but weren't that interested. And he decided to keep it himself, which has done him very well um, with his move to Greatest Hits. Uh, I'm not sure whether this will be a long lasting right. show. So straight to more four is a little bit straight it's to It's only DVD, six episodes, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Well, like I've got, yeah. We'll I've, got, see. I've got different opinions about it, but I can't say much. Okay. I, think, I think it's a really interesting commission for them. I, I think in answer to your question, I think it's about the siloing of the BBC. So I think that actually BBC TV didn't recognise the value of this format mm. and Ken kind of honed the rights to it. So he didn't go out there as a production company and pitch it. I think now when it got un- unshackled from the BBC, suddenly a lot of people... And I, actually, you know what? I was I walked into Waterstones on the way in to, to, to these studios and you can get the card game now. And I don't think the right, Popmaster okay. card game ever existed mm. before. And the reason I recognised it is because it's the first time I've seen Popmaster written as a logo. I've never seen it as mm. a logo before. And now it exists as a brand in its own right. 
So I think it's I think it's a really interesting move by Great Hits Radio. I think it's a really interesting move by More Four. I think there's interesting moves about the fact that BBC Four are not are doing well. Are, they're going digital and not going to be on TV anymore. And you know who knows? Maybe there's a space. That... I'm going to stop talking now. Watch, the, watch this space. Let's watch this space. Well, congratulations, Anne. You win the quiz uh, and you win the ability to launch uh, our own media podcast book club. Well done. Uh, needs to be multi-platform subscription options. Come back to me with all the details. Thanks to uh, our guests today thanks to Anne and Faraz uh, how can people follow you if not on Twitter I'm on Instagram as Fosman my company is Goldweller we'll be having an announcement soon I hope you can decide what it is we've got a new kids show coming out actually on CBBS on Monday called What's in Your Bag we're very excited about it we're, we're very proud of it so that starts on Monday at 10.30 in the morning on CBBS, um, and so, you'll be able to see it on iPlayer. Uh, congratulations! So everyone is to watch that live and on loop on iPlayer. Yeah, we haven't got a podcast episode. We do have a DJ episode though. Oh, very interesting. Uh, Anne, I am at Sparky Anne C on various channels, and Anne Charles TV. That's Anne without an E. Is my website. Um, come find me for interesting radio, audio, technology stuff, and especially object-based media, which is where I am hanging out a lot at the moment. So future of how we're going to make all of our programmes for radio, podcast, TV, film, everything. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Lovely. Thank you both. And we'll see you soon. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're recording at the very swanky London podcast studios in central London with a full HD TV fix rig and more. We highly recommend them. Um, why not book your next podcast recording here? Just go to the London podcast studios dot com. Uh, there's also a link in our show notes there's a few things you can do to support the show and help us keep bringing you the media news each week of course the most important thing really easy to do all you need to do is pop a credit card in uh, is our patreon just go to patreon.com slash media pod and chuck us a few quid to help us pay to the producers and this thing to be edited uh, patreon.com slash media pod um, also we'd love it if you gave us a plug uh, on social media doesn't have to be twitter it could be linkedin instagram tiktok whatever you like uh, and maybe just mention podfollow.com slash the media podcast and that way someone can click a link and come straight to us that's podfollow.com slash the media podcast uh, my name is matt deegan the producer was matt hill with support from phoebe adler ryan it was a rethink audio production i'll see you next week